Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Private Internet Access, a company that we have worked with since episode one of this program. Our the affiliate link can be found on our website at asknoahshow.com. They are a privacy-focused VPN provider. And the most important thing here, they have a track record. Anybody can say that they started a VPN company that cares about your privacy. What has set Private Internet Access apart in the past is that this is a company who has a track history of going to court, telling the court, hey, we'd love to show you the records of the people that you're requesting, but we don't keep records. And then the FBI and various different law enforcement agencies going through the various processes that they go through to try to determine if they can identify the people who use this service, come up with nothing. And that spoke volumes to me when I was launching the show and obviously, I care a lot about privacy, and I care about the privacy of all of you. And so we have recommended private internet access as a VPN solution since the day I've gone on the air. Well, this week, some interesting news came out, and private internet access is now merging with a company called CAPE. Now, CAPE is a company that's well-known for exploiting user data and, desert, and, and, and privacy-threatening software and, and all, all of that. By contrast, private internet access, I think, has done an excellent job of not only protecting user privacy, but actively contributing to open source. They contribute to KDE, they contribute to Blender, they contribute to GNOME, they contribute to Krita, Freenode. I want to read to you the letter from private internet access that addresses this. Good morning, all. First of all, I want to apologize for our delayed response. As you can imagine... With any transition, it's been hectic the last few days at the office. I just want to take a quick moment to address some of the concerns as noted by other Redditors. This concerns, as noted, this is very much a work in progress, but I wanted to briefly discuss how private internet access will operate going forward. The most important point I want to make is that we'll continue to operate as a separate entity, just like CyberGhost and ZenMate have since they joined Cape Technologies. The day-to-day -day operations aside, I want to make clear that this in no way changes who we are as a company. Actually, it does. It changes who owns you. In fact, it strengthens us and makes us even better, a better spot to provide our wonderful subscribers with improved products thanks to CAPE's backing. Actually, I would argue that the vast majority of us that use private internet access didn't have any problems with your products. We'll continue to remain fully committed to our founding values. Most importantly, among these is privacy and uh, well, the, the, the rest of this goes on to uh, kind of go talk about CAPE's commitment to adopting and upholding principles and this, that, and the other, all of which don't have a track record. The point here is we trusted private internet access because they had a track record of keeping users' data private. CAPE Technologies does not have that track record, and now they're one company. So does this mean that I'm canceling my private internet access uh, account? No, I'm going to hang on to it. But I do think it's important that we call a spade a spade. And this is no longer a company that I can come onto the air and recommend and say, hey, they have a proven track record of protecting users' privacy. The company that now owns them does not. Um, the, the, the letter goes on to say, I understand the concerns of being expressed in this thread as well as others, but please know as a company and a team, we would never make a deal that would jeopardize our users or our reputation without guarantees. Okay, so let's back up a moment. You have jeopardized your reputation. Maybe it's misfounded. Maybe it's misplaced. Maybe you can keep your company separate, but don't kid yourself. Your reputation is in question. There are people, myself included, who have serious concerns about this decision. Our chief communications officer, uh, Crystal, who has been at the forefront of the fight for privacy and security, has written a blog reaffirming our unwavering commitment 
to continuing the fight and how this will never, ever change. You can read it here. And then there's a link to the blog post, which of course we'll have a link for you in the show notes at asknoahshow.com. My team and I will do our best to address individual concerns. Please be patient as possible to know that our knowledge of the deal overall is relatively limited. <laughs> and again, it's primarily because the deal has not closed. So a few things there. First off, if the deal has not closed and the individual details of the, con- of the deal are not well known and it's, it, the, the details are, are very limited, then now is probably not the time to try to reassure people that you have everything covered because you don't know or you're not allowed to say that if you know or not know. So I have concerns there as well. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and private internet access has done a fantastic job for me personally for the past, I don't know, five years I've been using them. Every time I've gone to use their service, I have found it to be better and I found it to be easier than their competition. They have, for setting up on Linux, a simple script that you can download and run, and it creates a nice little GUI that you can use to connect to whatever server you want. In fact, it was private internet access that allowed me to utilize Sailfish OS because, as some of you are aware, you cannot purchase Sailfish OS directly from the site. You have to be in a country that they support. Private Internet Access allowed me to install their app, which I didn't have on that particular computer that I was working on that night. Click a country in the UK, click connect, and all of a sudden I was there. They don't collect any personal account details. You can sign up for an account, pay with Bitcoin. They just give you a generic account number, which you use to sign in. And of course, you set a password. It's a fantastic service. It's a fantastic way to operate. And again, they had a perfect track record of not giving up user data. So I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I have major serious concerns about this decision. And because of that, I thought we'd take some time tonight and talk about VPN technology. VPN technology has been around since the 90s. And essentially what a VPN is, is an encrypted tunnel. The best way I can explain it to somebody who isn't familiar with a VPN, think of it like a bulletproof jacket that you put over your packets that prevent them from being hit with privacy invading snooping bullets. It's called a tunnel because it's kind of like if you were swimming out in the open ocean from one place to another, everybody can see you in the ocean. Everybody knows what bathing suit you're wearing. Everybody knows, uh, you know, if you shave your face or don't shave your face and what color hair you have and, and those kinds of things. They can all see that because you're out swimming in the ocean from one place to another. They can probably see uh, where you're going, when you're going there, when you're coming from, the content, all that stuff. A VPN tunnel, think of it like a concrete tunnel that goes through the center of the ocean. You can see that there's a tunnel from one end of the ocean to the other end of the ocean, but what's inside the tunnel, we have no idea. We, we can't tell what the packets are. We can't tell what data they contain. None of that. It's all uh, hidden down by the VPN. So it makes it a very effective technology for communicating across the open internet. Again, our phones are open tonight, 855-450. No, it's 1-855-450-6624. You're on Ask Noah. Good evening. Hey, Noah. It's good good to talk to you again today. Same. Say, so I was looking into doing a project uh, this upcoming spring. Um, I want to put out some sensors around some, uh, a piece of property I have. Uh, the property is kind of... Uh, different elevations and I uh, it got flooded out this spring and so what I want to do is is have like a remote monitoring system set up to where I can kind of monitor the the water level at a certain location and I was hoping our uh, I want I'm looking into using a bunch of Arduinos set up in a mesh network and I'm trying to figure out if that's the best application for <clears throat> Arduinos and a mesh network I don't want to mm. buy a lot of extra hardware like routers and access points and all that stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Off the top of my head, here's what kind of comes to mind. Um, mesh networking, for the most part, is a, is a fairly inefficient way to communicate from one thing to the other, and so it, it doesn't scale very well. 
Um, that's not so much of an issue in your case because I'm imagining that this is uh, this is a localized thing. They're not. It's not. You're not trying to put these things all over the world and have them all communicate. It's all in just kind of one general area. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. So that's not so much of a concern. However, reliability is 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 something. So consider this. Right. If you have an Arduino and you connect it to a radio, the radio, if it's going to communicate with another device. Um, if it's going to communicate in simplex, in other words, one device talks at a time, the other one listens, you can do that with a single radio. If you want to do duplex operation, if you want one device to talk to the other device, and at the same time you want to simultaneously be able to receive information, now we need two radios. We need one for sending and one for receiving so that they can both be working at the same time. That's called duplexing. Are you with me so far? Yep. Okay, so when we get to duplexing and mesh, now we have to start to make decisions on how many radios are going to be talking, how many of them need to talk simultaneously, and to which other devices. Also consider the bandwidth requirements. If I have, let's say, let's say I have 10 devices, and they're all laid out in a row, and it's a mesh, so one talks to the other, talks to the other, talks to the other, talks to the other, talks to the other. By the time we get to the far end, that very last Arduino and its radios had to pass the traffic from all other, uh, the eight radios, right? And so the more, the, the, the larger that mesh infrastructure expands out, the, the more congested it becomes. So a, a, a more preferential way, and again, we're talking in kind of hypotheticals here, right? Because I don't know of any specific, you know, software or specific radio thing that does what you're looking to do off the top of my head anyway. Um, but in general, one of the one of the ways that ha that companies go about the process of trying to circumvent that problem is this: they'll put a radio in, and the radio will talk on like 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz or something like that. And that rate, it's not a mesh per se, but there is some sort of central device that's polling all of the other sensors. And then that central device is what you manage and is what is connected to, if you're going to monitor it remotely, that's the device that goes on the internet, so on and so forth. Now, there's a couple of advantages there. One is you eliminate the congestion of mesh technology in general. The second thing that you get, though, is from a security standpoint and from a management standpoint, as long as that one box is up, or maybe you have two because you want some redundancy, as long as that one or two boxes is up, you have one point to... Yeah, in the case of establishing VPNs, one thing to VPN into, one thing to put onto the internet, one thing to authenticate to, one thing to put your software on, so on and so forth. Um, and so if, if you look at any large automation system, that's generally the way that those things go. The other thing is I happen to know that uh, obviously North, living in North Dakota, growing up around a lot of farms, that's the way a lot of farming sensors work is that they have a, you know, a central thing that goes up on a tower somewhere or is, if it's not going out very wide, is just stuck in the ground. Um, and that device is then what communicates to all the little devices out, quote unquote, in the field. Um, so th those are some those are some big picture things that come to mind. But certainly, the process of trying to get some Arduinos and and tie them into some sensors to send data back is absolutely the way to go. One because it's inexpensive, but also because they are that's exactly what Arduinos are built for. Right. Let, let me ask you this: and, uh, what, what are you trying to monitor exactly? Just the the water level at a, a certain point on my property it, it, it the property isn't as flat as the rest of north dakota there are some some valleys and dips and whatnot okay um and so i'm just, i'm trying to come up with a way to to measure the water level and that that's kind of beside the point i was hoping i could figure out you know what kind of network i, I would have to set up first um, oh, I see. Communicate with the different sensors. I see. Well, if you're doing a mesh network, then the answer is pretty simple because you're you're uh, essentially you're going to be creating a, a simple ad hoc network, right? You're essentially going to you're uh, you know you're going to do you know if you're looking for the nuts and bolts, you're going to statically assign IP addresses. Um, you're going to uh, create a, a subnet like a slash twenty four or something like that, two hundred fifty four devices max, and then each one of those devices will will communicate to the others. Now, the exact process of getting uh, a mesh radio network set up, that's kind of outside the scope of what I can help you with in, in a five-minute radio call. But what I can tell you is that it would require somebody to write some software because 
you know, if ground sensor number six wants to send its information and, or, you know, water sensor number six wants to send its information, it has to know where to pass that traffic to. And, and so there, there's going to be some software and coding involved in that if you can't find like an open source solution that, that already exists. And my guess is if we were to Google open source, um, water level solution, I would guess that somebody probably has something like that because, um, that that's going to be some. I I don't know that a lot of people will do it outside, but certainly people do it to detect water in their basement and those kinds of things. And so I would imagine that you might be able to take something like that and augment it to fit your uh, your use case. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Uh, do you know of any projects that I could uh, kind of lean upon to to well one learn about mesh networks a little bit more and uh, uh, see what else has been done. Yeah, uh, as far as the mesh networking, what I would do is I would join some of the online communities that deal with WISPs because the most uh, the most knowledgeable people that are working with mesh technology and the people that know how to squeeze every little last bit of performance out of it are using it in WISP technology. Um, also, Nunix in the chat room says you could look into TDM, the general concepts of TC, uh, TCP three-way handshakes for comms reliability. And so essentially what he's saying is that there is a protocol out there that is specifically designed to do uh, three-way handshakes. And so you check, take a look at that. A, 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 you know, a quick Google search um, shows a device called the Water Tracker, which is a wireless water tracker. It's about 450 bucks. And it will allow you to remotely monitor water in up to three meters. Now, I don't know how deep you would need to put this device um, in order to, to fulfill your needs. But, um, but yeah, that would, you know, they, th certainly there are companies that are designing things to do what it is you're looking to do. Um, so there might be a box solution out there. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not. Not quite worth 450 bucks to you. Oop, did we lose them? We lost him. 855 450 no, you can give me a call back. But I, th I think we're pretty much done. Th th that, that's what I would do. I, I would look to see if some solution exists. The other thing I would do is I would also check out some of the home automation commun communities because those guys are the ones that, I mean, there's tons of solutions for detecting water, or the presence of water. So you could certainly go about it that way. Um, but if you wanted to know the exact level of water, um, you could uh, you could you could use some of the home automation things. The, the other thing that comes into mind that I might do if I were trying to solve your problem, if it's a static level, like let's say the let's say you have a well, let's say you have a uh, a ditch, and you want to know when the water rises above a certain level. It wouldn't take a lot of coding or a lot of brain power or a lot of money to take a simple float and mount it at a place in which when the water hits at the float trips, the float will give you a close contact that says, hey, float is, has been tripped. And you can, it's trivial then to have that send an alert, right? You wouldn't even necessarily need mesh technology for that. Um, you could simply have a little, uh, a little MiFi hotspot that's out there. You could have, I mean, I, I guess you said you didn't want to get into to networking stuff, but you, if, I, if it were me, I'd put a little hotspot, I'd add it onto my, my Ting plan for, you know, 10 bucks a month or whatever. And, uh, and put it in a little water and tight enclosure, put a little solar panel up there. Maybe this is $150 altogether. And, uh, and then I'm thinking I take that solar panel and I connect that solar panel to a, a little Raspberry Pi. And I have these little floats that are out there and either they're hardwired or I find a way to send that signal wirelessly using, you know, some sort of, I mean, you could probably use a home assistant, um, would do something like that. Right. And then it senses the sensor and it, it trips and then have it generate an email and send it out and say, hey, sensor number four tripped, and so the water level has risen above that level. I think that's about the process I would go if I were trying to solve that. But again, exactly, I'd have to know exactly what you're trying to do, but hopefully that gives you some some information. I will, I'll will i put a link to Home Assistant in the, in the chat room, as well as I'll see if I can track down just a basic float with a close contact for you, and uh, you can see if that gets you started. But do, give me a call back and let me know if that ends up working out, because... Uh, that's an interesting project, and I'd love to hear more about it. So VPN technologies allow us to create a tunnel, allow us to send packets through the tunnel, and arrive at the other side protected from prying eyes. What happens in the magic tunnel stays in the magic tunnel, at least in theory, but there are a number of ways to create this magic tunnel. And so before you can start looking at a VPN provider, you have to first understand what it is a VPN does, what it is a VPN doesn't do, and then the pitfalls of VPNs, and then the technology used to create them. And then you can start evaluating for yourself what you need, what you don't need. So the first thing I, I want to point out 
because I think there's a lot of misconception here, is that a VPN is not a foolproof technology. It's perfectly fine if you're trying to connect into the office and you want a secure way to access your files. Assuming it is set up correctly and you're using the proper technology, that's a perfectly acceptable way to access your data remotely. What VPNs are not particularly perfect at is trying to obscure your traffic so nobody knew that it came from you. First of all, anybody, even with private internet access, anybody that knows what the private internet access server addresses are, if they really wanted to look, could contact your ISP and say, hey, let us know when a, st an, a, when a connection from this location is established to that location. And you can watch when the connect, the same is true of Tor, you can watch when those connections are established. And if you had a suspicion that this particular user is going to this specific website or is this particular username, you can then monitor that website. And when that user is online or posting, you can cross check to see if a tunnel was established through private internet access or any other VPN technology. And so for those reasons, I don't consider them to be perfect as far as protecting privacy. Um, the other thing is VPN technologies tends to drop sometimes. If there's a connection problem, the VPN will drop and you're still on a given site. So the next time you refresh the page or the next time you click on something, all that traffic is going over your actual internet connection and in theory could leak your public IP address. And so for those reasons, I don't necessarily suggest it for, 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 for extreme privacy you know, cases. But if your general idea is I'm in the coffee shop and they really don't want my traffic going over God knows whose network, over God knows how configured, um, then the VPN is an excellent solution. And if you need remote access into your network to manage your router or to manage your services or something like that, again, I think VPN technology is, is a great solution for you. 855-450, no, it's 855-450-6624. You back with me? Hey, Noel, good to talk to you again. Yeah, I uh, sorry the call dropped there. I, I, what I would invite you to do is, uh, if you didn't hear the last of the conversation, I had a couple of other ideas that came, but maybe you can catch it on the rerun at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Um, was there anything else though? Uh, no, that about did it for the uh, the water sensors. I I was really just looking for a project where I could learn and have a practical use at the same time. So yeah, um, I wasn't really looking for anything serious to 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 uh, buy a commercial solution well, for. Well, good because I, I tell you what, the, here here was the rest of my here was the short version. The rest of my answer. Check out Home Assistant because Home Assistant does the kind of stuff you're looking to do in that you can set up sensors that that check things, and then you can have other things happen because of those things that happened. Um, and so that and and so that if if I was looking for a box solution or if I was looking for something as close to a box solution as I could get, Home Assistant would be the way to go. Not not only could you do your water thing, um, but there's a lot of other things you could do or just around your house just to kind of play with it. So I would check out Home Assistant, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well as uh, like a basic water sensor pump thing that or uh, excuse me, water float thing that that you could tie into there if you want to play with it. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, the next question I had, if you have time, I do. Um, I recently spun up a digital ocean droplet, mm -hmm. and I installed a free PBX. Yes. And I've been noodling around the internet trying to find a good tutorial or uh, something that'll help me kind of kickstart and get started and, and, and learn a, a little bit about VOIP mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Well, I tell you what. Let's. Uh, I'll. I'll give you the. I'll give you the thirty second rundown, and then uh, I'll. Pr I'll put some links in the show notes for. Uh, for some additional resources. Have you chosen a trunk provider yet? Not yet. I. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to uh, give a call to Vox Telsis mm -hmm. and uh, tell them, just tell them what I want to do and, and see what they can do. But, uh, you know. That's about all the thought I've put into it so far. Yep, and that—that's who I would call to. That's uh, we have we've ha they, we have a great working relationship with them. They do a great job, and I, I know they'll take good care of you. So here's the good news about going with Vox Telesis is they are actually going to give you a guide on how to configure whatever PBX system you want. And then after that, if you have if you run into any problems, their support team will get right on with you and help you walk you through exactly how to set all of that up. But the basic steps are this: you choose a trunk once you install free PBX, you create extensions. Extensions have a number and they also have a password associated with them. You want that password to be very, very long and complex because there are people all over the internet trying to break into them. But after you've done that, you can make basic intercom calls. You can call all of the other extensions. You can set up voicemail, all that good stuff. But if you want to actually talk out to the rest of the world, what you have to do is have a trunk provider. So if you chose Vox Telesis, they will give you 
a server that you enter into your trunk. They'll give you an authentication username and they'll give you an authentication password. And then above and beyond that, you can do something called IP authentication if you want to tie it, which is a little bit more secure. Uh, once you have the trunking in there, it's a, it's a simple function of setting up what's known as routes. And routes are basically when a user dials a given number set, what do I do with that? Do I dial it as an extension? Do I send it out to the trunk? Do I send it out to different trunks? So on and so forth. So a simple trunk would be just an asterisk, which means match anything the user dials, send it out the trunk. And that will get, that's the, that's the basics of a phone system. If you dial something, you'll, you dot whatever number you dial will go out. The problem with that, just putting the asterisk in is you will have to dial a, like, let's say you're going to call Alta speed, right? You would have to dial one seven zero one four zero two two three zero zero because you have to dial the entire 10 digit number because the, that's what the trunk knows what to do. And so you can create dialing rules for yourself and say, hey, if the user only dials seven numbers, well, I live in North Dakota. And so my country code is always one. My area code is always 701. So if you just see seven digits, add a one and a 701 to the beginning of it and then send the call out. If you want to get even more advanced and you want to get even more dig down into it, you can say anytime somebody dials a nine, that is going to send the call out the trunk. If they don't dial the nine, it's an internal extension. Just send the calls to one of the extensions inbound. And then you start to understand why commercial phone systems have you dial an eight or a nine to get outside. And so at Alta Speed, for example, we have nine to get a local number, eight to dial internationally. And if I dial eight, then it my dialing rule basically says, if an eight is dialed, asterisk. I will dial the entire number as I wish it to be sent to the trunk if I put put an eight in front of it. Um, and, 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 and yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a difficult or complicated thing. It's probably 10 minutes once you know what buttons to click and where to click them. Um, and Vox Telesis would certainly be able to help you with that. But if you're looking for the, I just want to get started right here and now, that's your answer. Add the trunks, add some dialing rules, and you'll be able to at least make and receive calls. Okay. Do they have that, uh, any kind of guide on their website or do I have to call support to get a, a trunk set up and then... They provide me the guide. You know, I think they used to have a a, a PDF. I will. Uh, I'll tell you as soon as we get off the uh, as soon as we get off I get off the air here. I will shoot a email to Mike and see if he has that PDF handy. And if they do, I will post it a link to it in the show notes for you. Otherwise, yeah, when you set up your account, yeah, in fact, you don't even have to set up an account per se. Um, if you go to voxtelesis dot uh, com slash ask Noah, they actually run a, a a promo for us, and so you will get. Uh, they'll waive the setup fee completely. And then they will give you a uh, a, a Vox Telesis plus one PBX plan um, for free, and you can use it for a certain amount of time. And then uh, and then if you like it, then you can actually uh, then then you can actually uh, you know sign up for an account. And um, it's it's a business grade SIP trunk system, and uh, it's just it's it's simple. It's a dollar per line, so a dollar per phone number because you got to pay for the phone number because they have to pay for the phone number, and then they charge you one penny per minute. That's it. Um, and then I, I don't know if they're still doing this for a while. They were actually, get, oh yeah, they do, they do they, So they waive the, the setup fees and they give you 25 bucks. So at one penny per minute, you can make, and $1 per month, you can make a lot of phone calls, uh, without ever even spending a dime. And you can do all of that right on their website. Uh, and I'm not even, I, I suppose you'd have to set up an account. So you have the, the trunk details, but, um, but yeah, they, they're great to work with and they'll take good care of you. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate the call. 855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. So the first kind of VPN tunnel that you can create is known as a PPTP. That's point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. Now, the good news about PPTP is that it is absolutely brain dead to set up. Anybody uh, could walk their 95-year-old mother through or grandmother through setting up a PPTP VPN system. In fact, most of the time, it's a function of logging into the router or security gateway or appliance or whatever it is and just clicking enable VPN. Set a username, set a password, good to go. Here's the problem. PPTP has been around for so long and has been embedded into every device known to man for so long since like literally Windows 95 that there are a ton of security issues with PPTP. In fact, it's highly likely, if not certain, that the NSA and other governments are actually decrypting the information that is in PPTP. And so as a VPN technology in 2019, PPTP is pretty much useless. Very easy to set up, probably marginally better than sending stuff over the open internet, but you basically should assume it's you're not offering any real protection. 
So that brings us to LT2P, uh, excuse me, L2TP and with IPsec. Now, L2TP is the layer two tunneling protocol. The problem with L2TP is that it doesn't actually offer any encryption. And so the answer to that is to use it in conjunction with IPsec. And you put IPsec over it and that will actually encrypt the traffic and then you send it over L2, L2TP. The problem with doing that, that two-step approach, I guess we'll start with the pros. The pro is that it's built into every modern desktop OS. And it's, again, very simple. Maybe not as simple as PPTP to set up, but very simple to set up. It's uh, effectively, there's a little bit more involved because you have to generate uh, the pre-shared key and you have to put that in the server side. And then that also has to be added to the client side in addition to the username and the password that you've set up. Um, and then you have to have the right ports but if you do all of that, it will work. And for the most part, it's fairly secure. The reason that I don't like L2TP, even with IPsec, is because it uses UDP 500. It always uses UDP 500. And so because of that, you can't, it can't be disguised as another service. And so because of that, many organizations, hotels, free public Wi-Fi, those kinds of things block uh, L2TP with IPsec. And so, and you can't really get around it um, because at the firewall level, they just say, eh, nope, not going to let traffic leave out of 500. IPsec in theory is perfectly secure. However, there have been rumors that have circulated around that the NSA has actually weakened the standard, but they're just rumors. So the, the real reason I don't like L2TP is one is it always operates on UDP 500, which makes it, like I say, it's just you're going to get calls from different businesses and different clients that are going to say, yeah, this isn't really working at this place or that place or VPN doesn't work all the time. Well, that's uh, we know why. And then the other thing is, remember, your traffic is being converted to L2TP and then they're adding crypto on top of it. And so it's a two-step approach. And so because of that, it's a much slower VPN and no, users notice right away. So is it better than nothing? Yes. Is it, is it, a, a, is it the best PDF or <laughs> PDF? Is it the best VPN software out there? No. Now, XMN in the chat room talks about SSH tunneling to VPN. And the truth is that while this isn't on my list of VPN technologies, because it's not something that we regularly deploy, it's a perfectly acceptable solution. It's kind of a hack around, which is kind of why I don't like it. But the truth is it's it's secure enough and it does the job. So you can create a tunnel over SSH and then you're able to to, to do essentially what you would do with, with a, a VPN. In fact, oftentimes uh, an SSH tunnel is referred to as a poor man's VPN and it works just fine. Now, Nunix in the chat room says just use something like PF to redirect another port like UDP 443. So it's just like the bogus HTTPS protocol. I'll get to how I attack the, or how I how I implement that solution. Again, my biggest problem is not necessarily the port or the fact that there are those that have tinfoil hats that believe the NSA is able to decrypt it. My biggest problem is it's just slow. It just sucks. It's not a good VPN technology. So let's get to good VPN technology. Open VPN. Probably the most popular, most prolific standard in VPN technology out there. It used to be, I'd say five, six, seven, eight years ago, uh, Cisco AnyConnect was everywhere. Everybody used Cisco AnyConnect. And I have watched those clients and those organizations that previously supported Cisco AnyConnect drop it in favor of OPN like hotcakes. Uh, OpenVPN is built on all sorts of open source technologies like OpenSSL, SSL v3, TLS v1. It's configured to run on any port. And so I can even set open, uh, I can even set OpenVPN up to work over port 443. Now, the advantage to that is looks like HTTPS traffic. Everybody thinks it's SSL traffic and nobody knows the wiser. It becomes indistinguishable to regular SSL traffic. And so thus, if it's over 443, no business is able to actually block it without breaking half the internet for all of their guests, which they're not going to do. And so I just kind of slip in there. Uh, and and Nunix asks, it says, I hope it's not SSL traffic. It is. It is SSL. It's using OpenSSL. I mean, it's built on a number of different things, and 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 we'll get to. Uh, well, I'll just get to it now. The, the, what you really want to do is use AES instead of the weaker Blowfish encryption, and you'll have a little bit better crypto on top of there. Um, the problem with OpenVPN is that it's not built into modern operating systems. Not built into Windows. I'm not. I don't think it's built into Mac OS. But so you have to download a separate app. Now it is built right into Linux, 
um, and you can just install OpenVPN. You can either install the CLI client or you can install the add-on for Network Manager. But the point is, it's available in your distro. But you're using a software stack to do this. Now, the good news about using that software stack is it's infinitely customizable, right? You can decide what port it's going to run on. You can decide what kind of authentication method you're going to use. You can decide what protocol you want to send. You can decide what encryption you want to use. You can tie it to, uh, you know, various different radius servers and other authentication methods so that if you have some larger corporate enterprise auth blob of single sign-on thing, all of that can be tied right into OpenVPN. And as long as you're using AES, it's very secure. In fact, we have no evidence that anyone, to include the NSA, has ever been able to compromise OpenVPN. And up until recently, it was my go-to standard, well, it still is my go-to standard for open for VPN technology when a client says, hey, we need a VPN, we set it up with OpenVPN. Now, I said, I mistakenly said used to because the landscape is changing. Recently, a new VPN technology has come out, and we have talked about it before on the show. It's called WireGuard. Now, WireGuard is in its infancy. It's just a few thousand lines of code, which makes it incredibly easy to audit. And it also means that it's very secure because there's not really any place for um, security nightmares to hide. It's built right into the kernel, and so it's super simple, fast, and lightweight to deploy. And it's, it's, e it's as easy as setting up is just generating SSH keys. So if you've ever generated SSH keys where you type SSH dash key gen and it gives you a public key and a private key and you put the private key on your box and you put the public key anywhere you want to authenticate to and all of a sudden now you're able to use SSH keys to authenticate, same story with WireGuard. You generate a set of keys, put one on a server, put one on the, the, on the computer you want to connect from, forward some ports, you're good to go. And we actually have a tutorial on exactly how to set up WireGuard because it's so easy and so simple over at youtube.com slash media. And so I invite you to check that out and you can take a look at that tutorial and see for yourself. I actually, when I was filming the video, I said something along the lines of, we're going to set up this uh, you know, WireGuard thing and it's not even going to take 15 minutes. Well, it ended up taking like eight minutes or something. And so of, I recorded the thing of saying, hey, this is what I'm going to do before I knew how actually fast it really was to set up WireGuard. And I ended up doing it in like two thirds of the time that I thought it was going to take. That's how fast it is. And so if you don't understand VPN technology or don't want to understand VPN technology or just need, uh, you know, I need to be able to access stuff in my house. I want to do it securely. I don't know what else to do. Use WireGuard. I have to say as part of our disclaimer it's not technically production ready, although I use it in production all the time, so I don't buy it. Uh, it's it's a perfectly well matured VPN. It again, it just doesn't take that much time to audit because the code base is so small. Now, the downside to WireGuard is because it's part of the kernel, a lot of advanced features like single sign and all the stuff I was talking about that you can do with Open VPN you're not going to be able to do with WireGuard, at least not yet. And if we ever can do it with WireGuard, it's probably going to be something that runs in user land, not as part of that actual kernel package. However, the fact that we have this kind of technology that's tied right into the kernel makes me believe absolutely with no equivocations that WireGuard is the future of VPNs. It's just today, as we record this episode on November in 2019, it's, it just hasn't matured to the point that it's widely deployed. But that's changing, as we're going to talk about in just a couple of moments. With private internet access uh, merging with this other company, I thought it would be a good idea to spend some time talking about some alternative VPNs that you could sign up. You understand the VPN technology if you've been paying attention for the last 30 minutes. Now you can t put that knowledge into practical applications and apply it to the various VPN service providers that are out there. So in other words, we... This is how you'd set up a, a, the ability to connect from one computer to the other. Now you can sign up for a service which already has the VPN server set up and you just have to connect into it and it spits your connection out somewhere else. It obscures your, uh, it obscures your traffic and it, it keeps you a little bit more private and keeps you anonymous. So the first one that makes the, my, my top list is Proton VPN. In fact, if Proton had VPN had been out when private internet access was born, I probably would have never signed up with private internet access to begin with because Dr. Andy Yen, has, who we've had on the show, has done an excellent job at creating a business in a country that we can be sure protects your privacy. And everything they do, their entire business model is focused on user privacy. Now, do you have to pay for Proton Mail if you want some of the more advanced features? Yes. Do you have to pay for Proton VPN if you want some of the more advanced features? Yes. Are you not writing those checks with your privacy, though? Absolutely. And they do have a free version. 
if you sign up for the free version on Proton VPN, you get three countries, one device, you get medium speed, it's peer to peer, you get their plus servers, secure core to our servers, secure streaming, uh, and um, and that's free. Now, or I'm sorry, you get three countries, one device, and and medium. The 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 uh, this thing did copyright. The four dollars a month, which they charge at forty eight bucks a year, gives you all countries, two device. You get high speed, peer to peer, plus server secure core, tour servers secure streaming, and you get a complimentary Proton Visionary mail service, which is essentially Proton Mail, but you can use your own domain. If they have some other tiers too that have a couple of other things, but for the most part, those are their features. And then it's anything above the $4 a month plan that you're essentially paying because you appreciate what Proton Mail does to include their visionary plan, which is like $24 a month. And the real purpose of the $24 a month is just to fund the development of Proton VPN. Now, this all may change in a little bit because when Proton Mail, if if Proton Mail decides to roll out their Proton Drive, which they're actively working on, and I can sign up as a business for Proton Mail, Proton VPN, and Proton Drive, and I can just basically get like the G Suite of privacy, I will do that so fast it will make people's heads spin. Um, and then that kind of settles it for me because one place I have to go to, a place that I trust, a place that I can use, and that has all of the things I need for my business, and it's focused on me, the paying customer, and not some three-letter agency and or some advertising analytics firm. If Proton VPN is not for you for whatever reason, I'd invite you to check out Movad. Movad offers a flat rate, five euros a month or five fifty uh, if you're here over in the U.S. And you pay as you go instead of committing to long-term subscriptions. So instead of paying, you know, like uh, like for a year ahead of time, essentially what they do is you can go on Movad and you just click generate account. It gives you an account number. Now you have an account. You can't use it until you fund, you add some time to your account and you put some time on your account by paying with Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. You can use PayPal. They have a whole, they're very flexible on how, how they take your money. And they are a VPN that's designed for privacy. Now, I have not seen a lot of court cases that have gone with Mulvet. I'm not saying they're not out there. I'm not saying they're not battle tested. I'm just saying I personally haven't come across them despite having looked a couple of times. Um, private internet access, it seems like they're all over the place of somebody that went to court and they have, and again, they have a track record and that matters to me. But I do like the fact that you can play with Bitcoin. I do like the fact that they have an excellent community cred, as the kids say. Go on any Reddit form or go on uh, go on some of the uh, the VPN forms. People are happy with their service. Go into some of the chat rooms. People are happy with their service. So I invite you to check Mulvad out. And um, if none of those are for you, then I still at this point am saying, hey, let's uh, let's hold off before we get too over the counter about uh, private internet access. I think that there is still the possibility that they come through this. I think that it's entirely possible that what they're saying is accurate, that somebody looked at private internet access and go, Hey, look at that. There's money in privacy. I guess we should invest money in privacy. I'll sure. Yeah. I mean, we made money off of violating privacy, but Hey, people want to give us money to protect privacy. Sure. I'll make money that way. I think there's this is absolutely valid. And I think there's entirely a, a chance that that that's correct. It just makes me nervous. So hopefully those give you some ideas and some alternatives that you could use uh, for VPN. If nothing else, I still invite you to go over to digital ocean, spin up a, fr- spin up a $5 droplet, and 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 install WireGuard or install OpenVPN and just try it and see how it works and see what it's like to browse the internet, you know, from a public IP address or from a different state or whatever. It's just fun to be able to open a browser up and go to Germany. And of course, if none of that is for you and you you just I don't have the money, I don't have the time, I don't have the budget, I don't have the setup, whatever, then use Tor. Tor accomplishes the same thing in a very different way, albeit, but Tor accomplishes the same thing of protecting um, your privacy online by obscuring your traffic and when i when tor unlike a vpn if tor cannot really drop i mean there are certain little vulnerabilities inside of the browser itself and that's only because after years of trying the government was unable to actually find any exploitations in tor itself so they had to go for firefox the browser that's typically bundled with tor and if you want to get around some of that use something like tails which is a live bootable usb drive so or yeah so even if your machine is compromised, it's only on that boot. As soon as you restart the machine, you start with a fresh session, you start with fresh files, there's nothing persistent on your machine. And so I'd invite you to check all of that out. 855-450-NOAH, that's 1-855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. You're on Ask Noah. Good evening. 
Hey, Noah, how's things going? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Uh, just kind of typically reach you and not doing too good. <laughs> How can I help? Um, I was just, just curious about that old question I brought up many times I want to discuss over there. That's why I wanted to reach you to other rounds. Mm -hmm. And figured you might want to um, drop me a phone or an email me. Yeah, absolutely. What I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll put you back on hold, and I will have uh, I'll have a call screener uh, take down your number, and uh, I'll give you a call as soon as I get off the air here, and we can talk privately. That's absolutely something we can do. Again, eight fifty five four fifty no. It's one eight five five four five zero six six two four. The email live at asknoahshow dot com. Justin Wynn, twenty nine of Naples, Florida, and Gary DeMarchio, forty three of Seattle, were charged with third degree burglary and possession of burglary tools after they tripped the alarm at the Dallas County Courthouse early morning. Now, picture this for a moment. The county of Dallas hires this company to go do some penetration testing. And so the penetration testers show up and they go to the courthouse and they notice that the door to the courthouse isn't even locked. Well, this was no fun, they say to themselves. So they walk in and go, well, that was easy. Now we now we successfully penetrated the courthouse and we have, we're in the courthouse. That sucks. Uh, that was not nearly enough fun. Let's see if we can do something better. So they go outside the courthouse, they lock the doors and rearm the, the alarm system and all the other stuff that apparently the, the county employees didn't do. And then they go break in a second time and they intentionally trip this alarm. So they wait and they actually time the response of law enforcement. Law enforcement shows up and they take out their paper and they go, here's our contract with the county. And we were hired to come penetrate. Uh, we were coming to, to penetrate the network and do some security testing of um, the courthouse. And so this is what we did. And here's how we tripped the alarm. And this is how we got in. It was actually wasn't even long. They go through this whole thing. Well, the sheriff's deputies, they're they're floored. They think this is great. They're like, oh, really? That's how that works? Well, that's how you got around that? Oh, thanks for telling us that. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you very much. You know, we really appreciate that. This is really cool. Then shows up the sheriff. What's this idiot's name? I don't have it handy. Chad Lennard. Chad Lennard. That's the idiot that showed up. So Chad, Sheriff Chad shows up. And uh, Sheriff Chad has to show him who's boss. So Sheriff Chad arrests them. They're hired by the county to go do a job. And the sheriff, because he's upset that the county asked them to come check the security of his, I suppose, as he sees it, his courthouse, arrests them. So the company they work for is a company called Coal Fire. Their charges were reduced on Friday to trespassing, a simple misdemeanor, after Dallas County Attorney Charles Sinnard requested that the men's charge be amended because, quote, the facts and circumstances of the case are now better fit the elements of the amended charges. Um, no, they don't, because they were asked to do this. They had a signed contract to do exactly what they said they were going to do. McAndrew said coal fire employees are often stopped by law enforcement, but he said in the hundreds of assignments they've done, this is the first time that their workers weren't immediately released after law enforcement saw their authorization letter and called the judicial branch employees that they were working for. The night his employees went to test the Dallas County court, Courthouse, McAndrew said they found the courthouse door open, and then they closed and locked a better... Yeah, we, we just talked about that. But anyway, so... This is one of those things that changes the landscape in a big way, because up until now, the advice that I have given and basically other every other penetration tester on the face of the planet has given is, hey, if you as long as you have uh, an authorization to 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 do these things, as long as you have a, a letter proving that you're able to do these, uh, you're welcome to to do that, you know, and, and you should not run into any problems, legal or otherwise. And this changes that because now every penetration tester and every security firm to include Alto Speed Technologies has to ask themselves, hey, even if I have somebody who is telling us that we have permission to do this, I guess you can still get put in jail for this. And I guess even once it gets to the district attorney's office, they're still going to try and charge you. This is pathetic and absolutely ridiculous, and these people should be ashamed of themselves. Don't hire a security firm to come test your security if you're going to put them in jail when they find your problems. Instead, focus that energy, effort, and money on securing your courthouse, for crying out loud. 855-450-NO, it's 1-855-450-6624, the email, live at asknoahshow.com. Uh, 
Lucas writes in and says, Hi, Noah. I'm living in Central Europe. Makes it hard to call you live since it's 2 a.m. here while the show is live. You know, it sounds to me like you just don't have enough dedication, but, you know, who am I to judge? I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do something you did many years ago. I'm trying to start my own consulting business. I want to ask you a few questions. If you were to start your own business right now, what would be the main flagship products or service that you would offer or put on your website? Well, the main service that I would offer would be one in the, the, the particular aspect that I want to work in. So for me, that's usually networks. I love networks. I love doing something in one place and watching something happen somewhere else. And so it would be something related to networks. The most profitable thing are monthly based services. So for example, if you're doing uh, managed services for, you know, MSPs have taken off all over the place and this is why. You can charge people 25 bucks to manage a, a desktop and say, I'll just take care of it. I'll do all the updates, all the antivirus, all that crap. And you just pay me a flat monthly fee and then you just manage it. And it turns into desktop computing into a service. And so if you want to make a lot of money, then go the MSP route. If you want to have a fulfilling career, then I would suggest you find the thing that you like doing. And if that's setting up servers, it's service. For me, it's networking. Um, but pick that thing and then center your business around that thing. The big advice that I would give you there is don't try to do everything and only do things that you can do well. If you can't do it well, just don't do it at all. I am still, after 10 years in the business, I'm still learning that lesson every single day. The other thing, the other lesson I would tell you is that nobody will ever care about your business as much as you do. So be prepared for extreme disappointment and extreme letdown the first time you hire an employee. You're an honest man. Thank you. How do you and salespeople execute the sales process, staying away from unethical sales techniques? What is your sales process look like? This is a big one for me, a big one. I hate, I don't hate salespeople. I hate modern salespeople. I hate people that try to push products onto people or services. My job when I go out to do a sales thing is not to convince you to buy a product or service. In fact, I'm probably a bad salesman. And so I'm probably not the person to ask this because I will tell you right to your face, here's a product we offer. I think it's a bad idea. I don't think you should do it. I don't think it fits your scenario. I can't count the number of times I've told a client that said, do you offer managed services? The last five people that we had come in said that we should do managed services. Dude, you call, you said you, you would call two, three times a month. It's not, why would you pay for, no, just pay us hourly. You, you, you'll save way more money doing that that way. Now, if you're a law office and you say, listen, all this stuff has to be up 100% of the time, no ifs, ands, or buts. Well, yeah, that would be a time to look into managed services because you have to make sure that somebody is available to help you exactly when you need it and you want that technology to stay up to date and current. But I, my job as a salesman is to match a need with a product and or service. Is there something that you can buy or is there something that we can do for you to fix that need? And what you'll find is if you approach sales in that way, people will be thrilled to write you checks. People will be thrilled to give you money because you have solved a problem for them at a reasonable rate. And, and it, it just, it changes the paradigm and how you approach the sales conversation. When I sit down at people, I spend probably three to four times more time listening to what the client is telling me than I ever do talking about a particular product or service. And then I give the client a idea of a couple different ways that they could solve that problem. And it usually goes something like, here is the bare minimum that you would need to spend to fix that problem if you want it fixed uh, you know, at all. Here is the way that I would probably do it. And then here is the quote unquote correct way to do it or the industry standard way to do it. Right. And so what that process might look like is access points, right? Well, if you're just trying to get John and Susie on the internet, we can just run over to Best Buy and we can just buy you a little access point, flash it with DDWRT, and you'll have a working access point to get John and Susie on. If you want the thing that I would do, I'd probably go with something like Unify. And if you want the end all be all, I don't, money is no object thing, then we go buy some, you know, $25,000 Cisco managed blah, blah, blah with, you know, $4,000 a year contract. And you can do something like that if you want to. I wouldn't spend my money there, but. I'll make more money if you do that, right? And I will just tell the client that. People don't mind when you make money. They just want you to make money because you're solving problems for them, not because you're making money off of them. What products or services do you, or advice do you not offer? What are things that I should stay away from? Uh, and then he mentions email service. Don't get into email. Unless that's all you want to do, stay away from email. Email will be, that will be your, that's all you'll do if you, if you do email. Um, as far as what not to offer, I don't offer, there's nothing that we sell or do at Alta Speed Technologies that I don't have in my house. If, uh, well, that's not entirely true in that there are some things that are not practical to fit inside of my house, right? Like I don't have, 
there's uh, there's just sometimes it's not practical. But if I was ever going to have a need, the products and services that we sell are the exact same ones that I use myself, which is why they change. Um, we started with uh, we started with Cisco. We used Ruckus for a while. Now we're on Unify. And incidentally, the access points in my house have followed that exact same progression because those are the products and services I use at my house. And so I know that they work because I have high standards. And so if they work for me, I trust that they're going to work for somebody else. And the second that Unify starts pulling crap where they start sending network monitoring statistics, guess what I do? I go back to the drawing board and say, well, I wouldn't want that in my house. I guess I better figure something else out. And then as a part of that, hey, if I wouldn't put it in my house, I ain't putting it in anybody else's property. So that means our product line changes. Now, Unify has kind of backed off and they have taken away that feature. And so we're, we're good for the time being, but that's what I would do. How do you manage or stay in a good relationship with your wife and children, spending as much time on all of your jobs, projects, and hobbies? Honestly, it's funny you should ask that. And it's funny that I picked this particular piece of feedback before uh, I actually started the show. Because if you notice, the very last call I got was a gentleman that was a little upset with me on the air because I haven't called him back. Uh, and part of that is because I do have boundaries. I prioritize uh, God, my wife, and my kids, then my business, and in that order. And that means that when I get done at 6 o'clock at night, if there's nobody that is on call to take an emergency, I discuss it with my wife that I have some stuff that I have to do because there's nobody there to do it. And then I fill that position. And when there is somebody there to do it, I'm completely unreachable and totally unavailable. And that's a function of a separate work phone system, separate work phone numbers, all that kind of thing. Hey, I got music in my ear, but I invite you to check out this week of The School at Hard Knocks. It actually talks about a lot of these marriage issues that you're asking me about. We talked about that with my wife. You can get it at schoolofhardknocks.show. Go check it out. We'll see you back here next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central.